This lesson is on pernicious anemia. In this lesson, we're going to talk about what this condition is, why it happens, some of the pathophysiology behind why it occurs. We'll also talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So pernicious anemia is an autoimmune condition that causes reduction in the ability to absorb vitamin B12 or cobalamin. So it leads to a vitamin B12 deficiency. And the vitamin B12 deficiency itself is going to cause a macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. So pernicious anemia is going to occur in older patients. The onset of this condition is going to typically occur between the ages of 40 to 70, and oftentimes it's going to be in the 60s and 70s. And there is another form of pernicious anemia known as congenital pernicious anemia. And this form of this condition occurs in children less than two years old. And there's a higher prevalence in families of affected individuals. So this indicates that there's a genetic predisposition for having this condition. And some of the genes that may be involved include HLA types A2, A3, and B7. And there is an association with this condition and having type A blood. And it may co-occur with other autoimmune conditions as well. So again, this is an autoimmune condition and oftentimes autoimmune conditions will co-occur with each other. So if you have one autoimmune condition, you're more likely to have other autoimmune conditions. So some of these can include certain thyroid conditions. So we're going to briefly talk about why pernicious anemia occurs, some of the pathophysiology behind why it occurs. But first we have to talk about how vitamin B12 is absorbed in the body. So if you were to actually eat something with vitamin B12, that vitamin B12 is going to be bound by a protein that is produced in the salivary glands known as haptocorn. And then that vitamin B12 and haptocorn complex is going to go into the stomach. Once the food containing the vitamin B12 and haptocorn complex enters into the stomach, there are cells in the stomach known as parietal cells. And parietal cells will release hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. And then the intrinsic factor is going to attach to the vitamin B12. The vitamin B12 and intrinsic factor complex will then travel through the small intestine and eventually end up at the terminal ileum. That's the last section of the small intestine before it meets the large intestine. This is where vitamin B12 is going to be absorbed. So it being bound with intrinsic factor is going to allow it to be absorbed at the terminal ileum. And then eventually it's going to go through and distribute through the body. And the reason I go through that process is because in pernicious anemia, the parietal cells in the stomach are affected. And in fact, what happens in pernicious anemia is there are these autoantibodies that are formed against the parietal cells and against intrinsic factor. So we can see autoantibodies, auto meaning self. So there's going to be antibodies that are produced in the patient's body that are targeting the patient's own tissues. And in this case, it's the parietal cells and the parietal cells produce intrinsic factor. And there are some antibodies that also bind to intrinsic factor as well. All this is going to lead to reduction in parietal cell number and also reduction in intrinsic factor. And as we just mentioned, we need intrinsic factor to bind to vitamin B12 and to allow it to be absorbed at the terminal ileum. So if you don't have enough intrinsic factor, you're not going to be able to absorb vitamin B12 appropriately at the terminal ileum. So regardless of how much a person eats of vitamin B12, they're going to have compromised absorption in this condition. So that's going to lead to a vitamin B12 deficiency. And vitamin B12 is essential for both the production of blood cells, including red blood cells, and also for central nervous system functioning. And because of this, we're going to see issues with signs and symptoms that involve both blood cells and the central nervous system. And at a biochemical level, we need vitamin B12 for the functioning of two enzymes in the body. One of them is going to be homocysteine methyltransferase. This is where this enzyme actually converts homocysteine into methionine, and this methionine is then used in the activated methyl cycle. And then the other enzyme that vitamin B12 is required for is methylmalonyl-CoA mutase. And methylmalonyl-CoA mutase will convert methylmalonyl-CoA into succinyl-CoA. And if we don't have enough vitamin B12, both of these enzymes are going to be affected. So we're going to have issues with conversion into methionine. So we're going to have an increase in homocysteine. And we're also going to have issues with the functioning of methylmalonyl-CoA mutase, which is going to lead to a backing up of methylmalonyl-CoA. So methylmalonyl-CoA is going to increase. And methylmalonyl-CoA actually gets converted into a toxic byproduct known as methylmalonic acid. So methylmalonic acid is going to increase and methylmalonic acid can lead to axonal neuropathy. Axonal neuropathy is where there's damage to the axons of neurons. This is why we can see issues with central nervous system functioning. And more specifically, it's going to affect the dorsal column medial lemniscus system. 
that leads us into the signs and symptoms of this condition. So we'll first talk about macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. As I mentioned before, vitamin B12 deficiency can lead to a macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. The reason it does this is because vitamin B12 is important in DNA synthesis, and we need DNA synthesis to produce blood cells, including both white blood cells and immature red blood cells. So macrocytic means that the cells are larger in size, and megaloblastic means that there is an issue with DNA synthesis. So because we're going to have macrocytic megaloblastic anemia, we're going to have signs and symptoms of anemia. These are going to include pallor, dyspnea, which is shortness of breath, presyncope or syncope. So presyncope is going to be the feeling of being lightheaded. Syncope is going to actually have a fainting episode and fatigue. And then there are going to be other signs and symptoms that are more specific to vitamin B12 deficiency. These are going to include reversible psychological issues, including depression and cognitive impairment, such as issues with memory and concentration. And then we can also have neurological issues. Neurological issues can include symmetric paresthesias. So paresthesias are going to be numbness and tingling sensations, and they're going to be symmetric, meaning that they're going to be on both sides of the body. So if one leg is affected, the other leg is also affected. We can also have issues with reduced two-point discrimination and a shuffling gait and imbalance as well. And if a patient has a vitamin B12 deficiency for long periods of time, these neurological issues can become irreversible. And these neurological issues are due to that exonal neuropathy we talked about before. Some other signs and symptoms of pernicious anemia include glossitis. So glossitis is an inflammation of the tongue, reduced taste perception, and then certain gastrointestinal symptoms like dyspepsia can occur in pernicious anemia. So dyspepsia is going to be a feeling of indigestion, and they can also have issues with diarrhea. These are going to be more specific to those issues in the stomach from those autoantibodies we talked about before. And then there can be some constitutional symptoms that can occur in this condition as well, including fatigue, anorexia, so that's a loss of appetite, and weight loss as well. And this condition has an insidious onset, meaning that it slowly progresses over time, and it can progress very slowly over approximately two to five years. So some symptoms can be very vague at first, and oftentimes this can be a problem for clinicians in actually identifying these signs and symptoms and the possible cause. Let's talk about the diagnosis of this condition. So as I mentioned before, the diagnosis may be challenging for clinicians because of all of those wide variety of signs and symptoms and because it's a very slow onset over time. What's going to be important for diagnosis is blood work. So blood work including a CBC or complete blood count, peripheral blood smear, indirect bilirubin, lactate dehydrogenase or LDH, and iron studies. We'll talk about why we need each of these here in a moment. What's going to be found is that we're going to see low hemoglobin, so this is going to indicate anemia. We're going to see a high MCV, which is a mean corpuscular volume. Mean corpuscular volume indicates the size of red blood cells, and it's going to be high, meaning that it's going to be larger red blood cells, and it's going to be over 100 MCV. So the high MCV is going to indicate a larger red blood cell. As mentioned before, pernicious anemia and vitamin B12 deficiency is going to lead to a macrocytic anemia. Macrocytic, again, meaning larger red blood cells. And so once we know that there's a high MCV and this is macrocytic anemia, we have to then look to see whether it is megaloblastic. So megaloblastic again means that there is issues with DNA synthesis. In order to do that, we look at PMNs or polymorphonuclear white blood cells or neutrophils. So we look to see if the nucleus of those white blood cells has multiple lobes. And in general, it's going to be four to five plus lobes. So if there are four to five or more lobes in those white blood cells, that would indicate that there's an issue with DNA synthesis, and that would indicate that it is megaloblastic. So then we have macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. Then we may also have issues with pancytopenia. Pancytopenia meaning that all blood cells are abnormally low. So this not only includes red blood cells, but also white blood cells, which would be leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia, which is a low platelet count. So this may also occur in pernicious anemia as well. Then we can also see that indirect bilirubin and lactate dehydrogenase are elevated. So both of these indicate that there is hemolysis going on. So hemolysis is breakdown of red blood cells. So because the red blood cells are not being formed properly, they can undergo hemolysis. And that's going to lead to an increase in indirect bilirubin and an increase in LDH. The next thing we want to look at is serum cobalamin, so vitamin B12, folate levels, methylmalonic acid or MMA, and homocysteine levels. So if we find that cobalamin is less than 150 picograms per 
milliliter, this classifies it as a vitamin B12 deficiency. However, the interesting thing with pernicious anemia that can cause issues with diagnosing it is the fact that cobalamin levels may actually be normal in a third of patients. Then we can look at methylmalonic acid and homocysteine. Both of these are going to be elevated in pernicious anemia and a vitamin B12 deficiency associated anemia. They're confirmatory, meaning that once we have these other findings, these will essentially allow us to confirm the diagnosis. And again, the reason that methylmalonic acid and homocysteine levels are elevated is because of those two enzymes we talked about before. So this is the reason why we can see these elevations in both of these. What's important here to make note of is that homocysteine is also elevated in folate deficiency. So if you were to only see homocysteine being elevated and not MMA or methylmalonic acid, then that would indicate a folate deficiency. Folate deficiency can also cause a macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. So this is the reason why we want to look at all of these parameters. So we also want to look at folate levels as well. And then what's also going to be very key for diagnosis is looking at anti-intrinsic factor antibodies and anti-parietal cell antibodies. So these are going to be more specific for pernicious anemia. Some other diagnostic procedures that can be employed include a gastric secretion evaluation. So in patients with pernicious anemia, they often have absent intrinsic factor, they're echlorhydric, and they have reduced total gastric secretions. So those are going to be the highlights of diagnostic procedures for this condition. But I also want to briefly mention the Schilling test. So the Schilling test is going to be an older test that was used to assess for whether or not a patient has a vitamin B12 deficiency due to a nutritional deficiency or if they have it due to impaired absorption. So the Schilling test is no longer used, but I want to mention it here because it is important in knowing it for examinations. So the Schilling test is where a patient is given PO vitamin B12. It's a radioactively labeled vitamin B12. They, they're given a PO or by mouth. So that would essentially help them replenish their vitamin B12. And then the second step would be to give vitamin B12 by IM injection or intramuscular injection. And then the third step would be to check the urine. If the urine is positive, that means that it was a nutritional deficiency that was causing the original vitamin B12 because we have the radioactively labeled vitamin B12 that is given by mouth and they're able to absorb it. So it's able to cross the gastrointestinal mucosa and get into their bloodstream. So that means that they don't have an issue with absorption. So the issue was a nutritional deficiency. But if the urine is negative for that radioactively labeled vitamin B12, that means that it was impaired absorption. So that radioactively labeled vitamin B12 that was given by mouth was not able to be absorbed across the gastrointestinal mucosa or wasn't able to be absorbed at the terminal ileum more specifically. So that would mean that it is impaired absorption that is the cause. Once pernicious anemia has been diagnosed, how do clinicians treat it? So treatment is going to involve vitamin B12 intramuscular injections, and it's going to be a lifelong treatment. Often doses are going to be from 100 to 1,000 micrograms per dose, and the 1,000 micrograms per dose is going to be often used early on in treatment to help replenish the patient's depletion of vitamin B12. There can be a vitamin B12 IM injection as a clinical trial for diagnostic purposes. So this can actually see whether or not a patient improves and that can help with the diagnosis as well. So I do want to mention that here. And the vitamin B12 can be in two different forms. One is hydroxycobalamin and the other one is cyanocobalamin. And then once the vitamin B12 is given, if there is a response by the body where there is a significant reticulocytosis, reticulocytosis is where there's a high level of reticulocytes, which are immature red blood cells. If there is high levels of those immature red blood cells, that confirms successful treatment, meaning that the body gets the vitamin B12 and then they're able to use it for DNA synthesis to produce those immature red blood cells. Repeated injections are going to be, again, needed to replenish the body's store of vitamin B12. And doses occur twice weekly for four to five weeks at the beginning, and then it will slow down to once per month. Other regimens include daily or alternate days for one to two weeks, then followed by weekly injections for one to two months, then a monthly injection for the rest of their life. Once a patient is given vitamin B12, they actually often start feeling better within 24 hours of treatment, and then the anemia itself will resolve within three weeks of treatment. Now, if the patient is not able to take IM injection for some reason, if they have an allergy to the injection, these patients can be given very high oral doses of vitamin B12 to treat this condition. And you may be thinking, why would we do that? If they have issues with absorption in this condition, don't we have to give it to them IM? 
However, there is a small amount that is absorbed still in the gastrointestinal system in patients with pernicious anemia, and it's roughly about 1% of the vitamin B12 that they're exposed to gets absorbed. So if you give very, very high levels orally, you can actually get enough absorbed to also treat the pernicious anemia as well. And then other treatments include treating other deficiencies if present. If they have a folate deficiency, you would treat that. In very, very severe cases and often rare cases, a blood transfusion may be required if it's a very severe case of anemia. And then screening can be important if the patient has affected family members. As I mentioned before, there's a genetic predisposition to this condition. If you want to learn more about other hematological conditions, please check out my hematology playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.